Hey, welcome to OTS Live. My name is Vin Blaine. And I should say good morning to you wherever you're calling from, morning or afternoon, wherever you're, you're joining. Today, well, you know, OTS Live is where we cover everything football, you know, from the administrative side, coaching, you know, even referees and players. So, and when I say even referees, it doesn't mean I'm putting down referees. But we're covering all those, all those areas. Uh, and today, we have a very special, special guest, a friend of mine who I think brings a lot to the, to the coaching education. And I will let him um, introduce himself and give you all that is about him. But we, we, we have no other than um, Kevin uh, Magreskin. Uh, I say he's, he has been, he's traveled a bit, Cook Island, you know, but and it was even in the region in, in the Bahamas. And um, he, I, what I'm saying is, and I believe that he, he has brought a lot to um, the game. So let me, let me, right away, let me say, welcome, Kevin. Hi, Vin. Good to be with you. Thanks for inviting me on. And good to, good to see you in, 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 in live and direct <laughs> uh, uh, for some time. But I'll tell you, it's good to have you on, Kev. And I would want to um, just let you give my, my listeners and my viewers, you know, uh, something about you, what they can expect today. Um, well, so something about me, uh, you know, I'm just uh, a bit of a, an adventurous coach. I've been, I've been lucky to have worked at different levels in the game, uh, coached professionally here in Scotland, um, uh, been around a few different countries. I was the technical director on the Bahamas, as you know, and, and we did some of the coach education stuff with CONCACAF. Uh, I was also in Canada for, for, for three years as a technical director of a very large youth soccer club up there, and that was a great time. Um, I also had the uh, short spells in Trinidad, um, help out doing a, a little bit of work with some friends down there, and down in South Africa, which was great. Really enjoyed that. And more recently, I was down in the Cook Islands in the South Pacific as the technical director down there. So I've, I've been very lucky to get around the world a little bit, see some very interesting places, and meet some great people. So. Mm -hmm. That's been good. And today we're, we're going to talk about scanning, you know, uh, which is a, a big passion of mine. Um, it's something that I really think that we we can help our players do better. And um, I've actually presented on this on the UEFA Pro Licence, A Licence, B Licence for about 12, 13 years, uh, predominantly with Irish FA, but I also presented on the Pro Licence and A Licence for the, for the Croatian FA. Uh, which was a great experience as well, and uh, a number of other associations have got me in to do, to present on their courses and um, uh, coach association um, gatherings as well. So I've been really lucky to get out there and engage with people and, and share my ideas on on this topic. Uh, like I say, I'm very passionate about it. I think it's something that we could really help players do better, which will mm -hmm. help them unlock their potential and, and be even more effective players. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, and I'm not going to let you get away this modesty, right? What There are a couple of things that I have to point out before we move on, and I want to speak to them for me. UA for A license in three different national associations. <laughs> English FA, Irish FA, Welsh FA. And I remember talking to you about this, Kevin. I said, why? Why Why do you want to, why did you want to go to... The, and I think your explanation to me was good. I don't want you to give my um, viewers... Why you think? Why you have three UEFA licenses in three different uh, national associations? Um, because I, I I just enjoy trying to learn and improve as a coach, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, you know, some people like to go off to fancy countries for their holidays. Uh, at that mm -hmm. time, I, I enjoyed going away for a couple of weeks on a coaching course and being with football mm -hmm. people and talking about football and learning coaching and and what I often say is you can go to uh, any country and do a course um, mm -hmm. but it's always going to be slightly different because the staff that are delivering are mm -hmm. slightly different uh, well they're different the, the candidates on the course are different and you can't forget how important 
that learning opportunity is when you're with the with your peers on the course, that candidate mm -hmm. group, you learn so much from mm -hmm. them, not just mm -hmm. the, the instructors, but when you're there talking about football all the time and, or people are delivering a session and you ask them about, oh, what was your thoughts there? And you pick up little golden nuggets here and there that you try and grab them and bring them into your coaching repertoire. So really it was just about learning and, and going away and enjoying football. <laughs> so it was, right. It was good. I, I, was I really know good. kudos for that, um, Kevin, because a lot of people, they do a lessons. that's it. They don't want to have anything else to do with, with that. And um, But let me tell my viewers also and listeners that we had a conversation some time ago. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I asked you, how did you get into coaching? And that's the best answer I've ever got. <laughs> you had a bad, you had a poor first touch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was it you know I retired early because a really bad uh, first touch um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, most people retire in early because of bad injuries mine was just a bad first touch so, yeah. uh, that was I, love that. I love that I love that so Kevin I'm, I'm, let me move on to what the, the, my viewers are definitely here for you know you said you're going to be talking about um, you're going to be talking about scanning and and that's 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 is exactly what we want to look at when we start talk about developing the art of scanning. That's what you really want to discuss today. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to this conversation, Kevin. I'm sure the other people that are here are looking forward to it. But before I start, I want to welcome uh, my my viewers and my people all who joined just now. Um, I'm, I really appreciate you guys joining us, coaches. You joining us? Uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, because that's during the during the presentation, Kevin will stop. We're not just gonna let it go all the way through just like that. We're gonna be pausing at times and you know, if you have questions, please post them in the chat so we can um, put it up on, on the screen and Kevin can know exactly what what, we, uh, what the question is all about, even without me reading it to him. So uh, we have a couple we have a few people on uh, already, um, Kevin. So let's let me turn it over to you, Kevin. Uh, let me put your screen up that you can do your thing. Okay. <clears throat> right, I'll just. Uh... Okay, is, is is that open, Vin? Yep, that should be fine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, oh. it's up. let me get it fully up for them now. Uh, go ahead, Kev. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, but we're going to do the. Uh, you know, talk about developing the art of scanning. Um, so we'll talk about scanning, uh, its importance in the game, touch on some work that have been, that, some great work that others have done around this, and I'll show some exercises that you could, you know, hopefully use uh, with your players that are simple, a little bit different. But this opening slide here, um, just uh, the, the the main picture with me in the blue shirt that that's me presenting on the the Irish FAs. It'll either be the A license or the Pro license. I can't quite remember with that one. Um, the the bottom left picture of the Croatian one with the classroom setting that that was when I was presenting on the Croatian FAs uh, Pro license. So that was that was a really great experience. And the top two pictures there are. Two of the professional clubs I've coached at in Scotland, the one on the left, Partick Thistle, and the one on the right, there's Dundee United. And we implemented uh, these ideas on developing awareness and improving scanning at, at the first team level there. And that's some of the things that I do. You can see the bright coloured gloves. Uh, I do some weird and wonderful things in training sessions, but uh, it works, you know, and it has a real benefit. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of that today. Um First of all, you know, I, I, I can may as well talk about some of the great players and, and what, what they've said about the game, the great people in the game. And uh, Johan Cruyff uh, said that you play football with your head and your legs are there to help you. If you don't use your head, using your feet won't be sufficient. Um, you know, and, and we talk about this a lot. Uh, and, and it is, you know, it's a hugely cognitive game that we play. And, of course, there's we've got a technical component, we've got a physical component, but there's a huge cognitive component about the game that um, maybe maybe as, as coaches we could be helping our players be better at. And I know that we're all striving to do that with our players. Um, so this thing with the head, if we, if we look at, first of all, decision-making. So I'm going to talk about these things because they lead into scanning and why scanning is important and first of all if we look at decision making 
uh, I use a model, see, think, play. That's that's my uh, basic decision model that I use uh, when presenting and when I'm thinking about my coaching. And a lot of people see decision making as a linear process. You know, first you see, first you think, then you then you play. You can't. That's you execute the game action. So the seeing being the perception, the thinking being the decision making, the processing. And the actions, the output, and, and we often judge our players on the output. Um, we see it as a linear stop-start thing, but that's not really how it works. Um, and we often tell our players to look before they even get the ball, so they have an idea what they're going to do before they get it. But what you actually find is that players, a lot of players and far too many players, they'll receive the ball first, they'll control the ball first, then they'll look around. and and it's too late then, you know, that that's too slow and too late and that's that's the wrong way around. So we need to, to get them thinking about that. But I don't think of it as a linear process. And there's there's some great decision making models out there for people going look at go and look at Gary Gary Klein's uh, um, recognition present uh, recognition prime decision making model. That that's great. John Boyd Zoodle Loops, fantastic to read about. Um, uh, Daniel Kahneman's books on 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 the decision making process, and there's been a couple of good books. A, a friend of mine, Len Zykowski, recently, the Playmakers Advantage, then the follow up, the Playmakers Decisions. And uh, so, again, you can find more about decision making in, in these books. So, really recommend that reading. Um, but I like to think it's a more of a uh, multi-dimensional cycle um, because I really believe each part influences each other. Um, so how you see influences how you think, but how you think also influences what you see, you know, and how you think influences the actions that you're going to take, but the actions that you're capable of taking also impact on how you think. And then, the, you know, how you can play the game and the action capabilities you've got will then determine how you see the game, what your perspective on the game is. Um, so, but we're not going to go into this too much, but just to touch on that and say that it really is a, a, a holistic process, a multidimensional process where each of those components, I believe, affect the others. But what we are really going to talk about is, is that this area here, although it's bigger than just this little red circle that I've put around it, um, it really envelops a lot more of it, but the um, the perception side. So what, what, what do we do there and what could we do better there? Um, but we won't go into all the other offshoots in the decision-making model, but I'll explain that in a second. Um, another nice little quote uh, from, from Guardiola where we're talking about decision-making there, and he says, taking the right decision in the right moment that is the most difficult thing in football. Yeah, Kevin, and, and, uh -huh, before, uh -huh. you, before you move on, back to yep, the slide. Yep. Back to the slide. Back to with, that. With, yeah. yeah. Could you just, just um, could you just sort of uh, expound on these, the, the meanings for me, please? Just, I'm not assuming anything. Referencing, <clears throat> framing, and yeah, then localizing. Yeah. Just, 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 just rather to deepen that for me, please. Okay, okay. okay. So, okay. so I, I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily going to go into it because then this re, uh, we could start going into the whole decision no, making thing. But I can no, touch no, on a basic, it. Yeah, it's a basic so, reference. Come on. Yeah. So, so, so referencing. Um, now that the the icons are a bit small over on the right there. So referencing. I, I, I see that, that there's three main things in there. Now there's a whole load of different things, but the three main things I focus on are scenarios, situations, and signals. Okay. So signals are what you perceive and what your brain will compute. Um, so signals are like the advanced cue utilization that they talk about, the subtle body cues and body angles that players give off that means that you could look at that and kind of interpret what they're going to do. Um, situations are game situations that happen. So it happens in front of you. And what happens is the brain quickly makes sense of that. And basically it's it's kind of like it's got a catalog of previously experienced situations. Now, there, there's no two situations that are ever exactly in the same, but, but they're similar enough that you can use them as a template um, for your decision-making process. And then the scenarios are... are 
like the patterns of play that coaches run. So so that's actually you know what you're looking for because you're trying to get a certain pattern of play done or a carry out something. So your brain is going to guide your eyes into can I try and see these visual cues to say that this scenario is on, this pattern of play is on, then we're going to do this. So that 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 would be the reference. And so that's the kind of bit that, that connects the the, the the eyes to the brain, that, that little corner there, what's going on in there, that two-way process. The framing is is how really you contextualize things and, and um as in that's from the brain to 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 the feet. Let's think of it that way. So that's what's going to frame the actions that you are likely to carry out. Okay. And in there I talk about normally tactical technical and tendencies so tactical the tactics that the coach has given you but before you've went out in the game you know that will guide you in which actions you're likely to select for that situation that you're in so and um, and again that 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 can have context of what's the score are we, are we winning are we losing and it can also have the context of the area of the field as well um, are you in the defensive third, middle third, attacking third? Because what the coach or what you might want to do in the defensive third could be very different from what you might want to do in the attacking third. Like take somebody on 1v1, etc., or look for a passing opportunity instead. So tactics will, will guide those action selections that you'll make. Technical component will also guide the, the, the thought process. What you are capable of, you are, you, you're going to be limited to those, act those uh, technical capabilities. That's why it's important that players become increasingly technically proficient because it opens up a whole load more of solutions that are available to them. And then the tendencies, and what I talk about, that these are less about what a player is capable of doing and, and more about what a player likes to do. You know, you get those players, they're great passers, but you know what? They just love to take people on 1v1. So even though they've got a passing opportunity, they will look to try and beat somebody 1v1. You know, it's it's like something inside them that they really want to do. Um, so the tendencies play a part in, in what actions you'll select as well. And then the 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 localizing between the between the perception, between the see and the play. And what I talk about is prospecting, priming and perspective. So prospecting is actually how you move about the field and look for information that's going to be important. Okay, so and, and the way that you do that, and we'll come on to a performance cycle in a bit, is active scanning, looking about, but also where do you position yourself on the field, both in terms of location on the field and your, your body shape. Okay, so um, it, that, that's that's really important. It's, players don't do enough when they're off the ball, and we'll talk about how much you are actually off the ball in a little bit, and they should be engaging in more prospecting throughout the game. The the perspective kind of links into to the, the technical component and framing, but the, the priming, it's like, I put this more, you see something and you automatically respond. Okay, so the situation that you're in primes the response and you just do something on almost on autopilot. Now, we could debate, is there a decision there? Well, yeah, there probably is, but it's a really a really subconscious level. You know, the go around the top bit the, through the reference and framing, that's more your conscious decision making here. It's it's the unconscious decision making. Sometimes you just you just react. Um, so. So that that's that's what these are, and that's how they influence each other, and, and how they're kind of two way. Um, and I could go into a whole load more detail, but we, we could be here all day talking about that. But I would really recommend those those authors that I've talked about with their decision making models, because it's it's really insightful and will help your coaching. So th does that help, Vin? It definitely, and I, and the reason I did that because this is it's especially the referencing. This is something that players and coaches who are, who are going to be uh, influencing players in scanning. Mm -hmm. It's very important that they understand what the referencing means. Uh, oftentimes, we tell the players, you can read the hips of players, of your opponents, and you can their body shape can tell you exactly sometimes what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that's that's communication from the player from the opponent to you yeah i think if they can start with that referencing then it leads into all the other that you spoke about and i'm and i'm really really um glad that you, we, we did it over so um you can move on now kevin thanks much. yeah yeah no problem at all and anytime you've got any other questions like that happy yeah. just to pop back and and uh, elaborate a little bit more on things. So, as I say, Guardiola taking the right decision in the right moment, that's the most difficult thing in football. And it is, because um, it's a really complex game. People say, ah, it's a simple game. No, it's not. You know, you've got, when you look at the adult level, um, you've got 22 or 23 moving variables on the field. You know, team, your team, their team, and the ball. And they're all moving around at different pace on a really large area with an infinite number of combinations and no two situations are ever repeated. So it is, it's, it's not really a simple game. It's a hugely complex game. Um, but, you know, there's certain principles in there that help us make sense and make it easier and, and simplify it for us, which is great. But I think... Um, it. He's right. Uh, the I think he's right. This is Guardiola. You know, he knows more than me. So, yep, he's right. Uh, taking the right decision in the right moment. <laughs> you know, that's the most difficult thing. And but I think one of the the reasons for that is because players don't scan enough. They, they don't have right. up to date information. They don't know what's going on around them enough right. to be able to make the right decision. When, once they get the ball or once they've got a call to action, you know. Uh, so and I really think that's one of the, the, the key things that, that we, we can try and help our players with. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, a game awareness model that, that I use. Um, and it's a, a three-stage game awareness model model. Uh, and it's based on something called situation awareness. So there's a, a model for situation awareness that was developed by uh, Mike Ensley um, many years ago. And the roots of this is in aviation, and so pilots. But situation awareness is proven to be applicable whether you're, you're flying a plane, whether you're driving a car, or whether you're playing sports. And Mike Ensley's done some some great work, and I've, I've been very fortunate to, you know, I've... Um, chatted with her quite a few times about this and she's really helped guide me and my thoughts on this so that, that that's been great um so it's a really simple model for for understanding what awareness is and and what we maybe need to do about it um and the first thing that that i'll show there at the bottom there's ends part of ensley's model um and awareness what we need to understand awareness is not decision making it feeds the decision-making process, okay? It, it's a crucial part of the decision-making process, but awareness is not decision-making itself. And, and her three stages, um, level one, level two, level three, perception of elements in current situation. Level two is comprehension of current situation. Level three is projection of future status. And I've put on the right there a quote from her uh, where she says, level two goes beyond being aware of the elements that are present to include an understanding of the significance of those elements in light of pertinent operator goals. And the reason that I highlight this is because when we look at a model for game awareness, often when we talk about scanning and having a look and this kind of thing and awareness, people start talking about, yeah, but, but it's it's what the meaning that the players take from what they see, that's what's important. And yes, it is. It, it is. it is important. But we missed the first step of getting them used to moving their head and accessing information in the first place. Because understanding comes at level two. Just accessing information comes at level one. Now, there's huge overlaps. It's not like these are completely discrete elements. But the, the understanding comes at level two. Right. So, yes, the context has to be there for you to be able to then make good decisions. But accessing it first um, is, is not where understanding sits. It's just looking around. So level one, I call observation. OK, and uh, this is active scanning of the playing area and panoramic positioning. And what I mean by that is active scanning is normally, you know, 
a movement of the head, and we'll come on to somebody called Gear Jordet, who's who's done a lot of great work in, in this field. He's a, a researcher, some fabulous studies. Uh, but active scan, moving the head, but sometimes uh, a bit of scanning could just involve the eyes, but a lot of the time it'll involve moving the head because you're maybe getting the ball from here and you're maybe going to look to try and go there. So you're receiving the ball, but you're checking there. So the active scanning part, always having a look around you. Essentially, panoramic positioning. So, what I'm talking about here, panoramic positioning, is just getting the maximum field of view that you can. You know, so position your body so it's open to as much of the field of play as possible, right? And in a good location on the field so you can maximize, so you've got maximum view of the playing area and the things that are in there. Um, and th that's it. And fundamentally, that's what a lot of players need to get better at. And, and even making sure that you're instead of facing the ball when you're receiving it, you're open. And we talk about this to players. But can you be open? Why? Well, one, it'll help you do something. But two, it opens up your field of view to things. So active scanning of the playing area and panoramic positioning are key at this stage. Because, yeah. yep, Vin? Kevin, let me just, um, just kind of coming here i have a lot of viewers from the caribbean mm -hmm. and we have a lot of caribbean countries that the fields are not that good one of our problems is looking off when the ball is fast mm -hmm. to, scan, to scan and the ball is bouncing all over the place <laughs> because of the surface of the field right um i know we have to do it just the same regardless but that is something that I think that, what would you say to coaches like that, that are in that situation? You know, because uh, how do we approach it? Should we still go ahead? And even if the, even if the boy is, is, is passed uh, and our miss is missed the pass, mm -hmm. my approach, I don't tell you what my approach is. I don't, if I'm training, I don't care if they make a mistake or it goes all right. You know, if I said, I want you to put pace on the ball and the mm -hmm. ball maybe a little harder than normal, I still don't, I, I sort of uh, not say anything to them about that because I just the idea is to get them to pass the ball at pace. Yeah. So, what would you say now in that light? What would you say to these uh, coaches who are saying that you know they scan and they look around and the ball is got, is off already? Do they? It, does it come down to the timing of the scan? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that that that's incredibly important. And I've got I've got a slide a little bit later where we'll talk about timing of the scan. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the timing of the scan is is going to be crucially important. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there, there's loads of times when you can, but I'll I'll list five key times. And one of those is when the ball has come to you and when you're receiving a pass. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you look as late as possible, but as, as, as early as you need, um, is, is my guidance to players. But there, you know, there are variables. You know, um, they might need to try and have a really, if they're going to have one of those last scans in there, that check again, as I call it, mm -hmm. then yes, they, they are probably wanting to make that as quick as possible so they can get their eyes back on the ball. Now, the crucial mm -hmm. thing is you, you, you've got to, to, have your eyes on the ball as it's getting past you so you can judge how's that ball being passed to me, what's the speed of it, what's the line of it, so you can ready yourself for that. You want to try and have one last look away, but also understand that players, if the field isn't very good, if the conditions aren't very good, want to get back so they can concentrate on the ball because that's going to be challenging to control because it could go anywhere. But it's like anything. The more they practice it, the better they get at it. And they, they, they then become better at readjusting like some of the stuff that I throw into sessions. It's mm -hmm. all about trying to get players into unusual and uncomfortable body positions so they can still react effectively and control the ball really well and be excellent with the ball, even with late adjustments. And and that's going to be one of the key things. But that scanning, that's only that scan when the ball has come towards you is only one moment you should scan. There's a whole load of other moments that you should do. And if the only time you're scanning is here, then you're not going to succeed. You've got to do all the scanning all the other time as well. And if you can scan at this last moment, this when the ball's on its way to you, that's the cherry on the cake. So younger kids might feel, 
a bit of a struggle. But like you say, how can you support them in the learning, in the mm. sessions? Right. Uh, instead of saying, well, keep your eye on the ball, because that's mm -hmm. what we tell them. Yes. Actually, that's that's not what's going to help them when they, if they're trying to get to the top level. You know, right. it's almost the worst phrase ever invented in coaching. Mm -hmm. Keep your mm -hmm. eye on the ball. You know, that there's only very specific moments you should be looking at the ball. And I'm right. not saying you shouldn't ever look at but there's only specific moments you should look at the ball or, mm -hmm. or need to look at the ball. So um, we, we should be, like you say, we should be willing to support our players in those challenges. Mm -hmm. If you've got a poor pitch, it's going to bobble. And you've got to understand that they're going to be challenged with their controlling skills, especially if you're trying to build this into the receiving skills, this scan. Can you have one last look? Mm -hmm. Because, But they'll get there. You know, give them more experience, more time. They will find a solution for their body. They will find that timing that works for them. And, right. and they'll crack that nut. But we need to support the players through that and understand that, hey, you know what, there'll be mistakes along the way. But that's right. a natural a natural part of the learning process. Yes, I like that. I have a, before we move on, um, into, <laughs> that's the risk. I have, a, I have, a, I have, a, I have a, um, a question from Solomon. Uh -huh. Right? Uh, actually, I let you know he's from Saint Lucia. Oh, um, nice! <laughs> yes, his, his question is: What is the ideal age group to focus on scanning? Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, gr uh, great question, Solomon. I absolutely love it. And um, I've said, I've kind of said the same thing on on the course as well. But this guy gears your day. Um, he was on a webinar recently, and he said, "Well." When do you teach the kids to to look both ways when they cross the street? You know, at what age do you do that, <laughs> right? And and uh, you know, and I've uh, you know, and, and it sums it up perfectly. You know, yeah. um, you know, as early as possible, um, because yeah. I've worked with players at the top level, but I've I've coached this to kids as young as seven, and and does that mean that they were perfect? No, but they got the idea, and they mm. were trying it. You know, they were trying it. They got this, you know, because we're doing it in a playful way and they're having fun and they get this idea about not looking at the ball all the time because I'm a big advocate of players develop as the environment demands development, right? And and if we create an environment that forces them to develop certain behaviours, that's the behaviours that they'll, they'll take with them. That's the behaviours they'll, they'll learn. And it's so as young as possible and it's... Sometimes at the younger stages, you're just planting a few seeds. Okay, you're just planting a few seeds and seeing how they grow. It's not a often the obstacle there is is my experience is it's us as coaches, and and we feel that if they keep getting it wrong, well, uh, they're not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're getting a go, and they'll get some of it right. They'll get some of it not right. So often it's what our expectations of success is as a coach that puts the limiting factors on what the kid's trying to achieve. So, and again, if you understand that they're going to get things right, they're going to get things wrong, and it'll be this, but that, that's learning. So as young as possible, and the focus on scanning, I put it as how important do you see decision-making in the game? And I ask this on my presentations. How important is decision-making? And most people... And I agree with it's on a scale of one to ten. I say ten. It's a ten. It's it is important. I say okay. If uh, it's a ten, and awareness scanning directly contributes to the effectiveness of decision making, how often should you work on this? How often should you have this focus? So my idea is that you should be doing it from as young an age as possible and you should be building things like this into every session. Now, that doesn't mean to say it's the only way that you coach and it's the only thing that you have in your session, mm -hmm. but you should be doing a little bit each time. And the sessions that I'll show you a little bit later, they're simple, they're easy enough to implement. And the football sessions, there'll be sessions similar to those that the coaches that are on are already using, and that's on purpose. So, yeah, as young as possible, really as young as possible, and just letting them have fun exploring that space and trying it is, is really key. All right. Thanks, Solomon. All right. You can move ahead now. Okay. Um, so that's level one. Level two, realisation. 
So that's reading the game and adaptive positioning. So this is where understanding and context comes in there, that the, the players are able to put the pieces together. And again, this is not to say this is a hierarchy that level one comes before level two. You know, level one, and I'll come on to it, is part of level two. You know, it's each they're nested in each other. So this is where the players are then able to put meaning and understand the game here and now, what this situation means. An adaptive position means instead of it just being panoramic to see the whole field, they position themselves optimally in relation to the ball teammates and opponents around them that are key. So the, the, it's it's adaptive positioning there. So it's, it's in reference to these things. So I might need to have my body a little bit like this because I'm thinking here and here and that. Or I might need to have it like that because I'm thinking here, there, and that. Instead of this panoramic position and just being open to everything, no, it's in relation to key reference points, which are normally ball teammates and opponents. And obviously the, the space as well, and we talk about that. Um, but I try and keep things simple for myself, you know, so... I give myself three things to remember as opposed to four <laughs> um, things. So I say ball teammates and opponents because I really feel that, that space is ultimately dictated by the position of the teammates and opponents. Where they are not, that's where space is. So if you know where the teammates are and you know where the opponents are, by virtue of that, you know where space is. But there can be a subtle difference in, in when we talk about that. But so adaptive positioning, getting your relationships right now. And your, and again, that's location on the field of play. So you might need to move a couple of yards left, right, up, down. And also this, you know, orientation of the body. You know, which way have you got your body oriented? Does it need to be this way? Does it need to be that way? So and then even something as subtle as your feet, you know, is your right foot in front of your left or left foot in front of your right for that kind of position? You know, and these are the kind of things that hopefully players start learning as they're self-organising their bodies. But we as coaches are there to support that process and, and help them if need be. And then level three, anticipation. So predicting how the play is likely to develop and prospective positioning. So <laughs> this is where it kind of gets a bit complex, but... It's just now you're able to understand what's happening in the game and you're able to go, yep, yeah, this is happening and this is what's likely to happen next. So I could see that the ball's there and I reckon my experience is telling me and I've seen this situation before and I can see the way they've got their body angled and the way they're receiving the ball. They're going to try and switch the play over there. So I know that. And the perspective position and what we're on about is, is that action that you take before you take your game action. So I can see there's a switch coming. So there's a switch coming. So what I'll do is I might start giving myself a, 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 another step, two steps, three steps this way and start getting my body position right for it going there. But I don't completely sell myself to that because that player might keep the ball in here. So I need to still be engaged here somewhat, but I'm starting to get myself ready for what I think is going to happen next if that makes sense. So what we're talking through these, that's that's really advanced and we want to strip it back mm -hmm. to scanning, but they're, they're so linked with each other that it, it's worth having a chat about these things. So, um, and that's the three things there, like, and I've got observation, realisation, anticipation, and, and they're nested with each other. They're, they're not discrete levels, hierarchical levels. They, they affect each other. So, to be able to anticipate right, you need to be able to understand the game and you need to have looked around because if you don't, you're not going to be able to anticipate, quite frankly. And it, with the realisation, if you haven't looked about in the first place, you've no information to work off to make sense of it. So they, they really are linked. And this is a little performance cycle that runs A through to F and then keeps going. Um, so I'll quickly run through this. Active scanning. That's what players should be doing all the time, even when they're off the ball, right? Especially when they're off the ball, because we'll come into that in a second. But have a look, right? So really, that's what it's about. Have a look. Can you look about? Can you think, where's the teammates? Where's the opponent? Where's the space? And can you do it more often than you do just now? Body position. Can you adopt and can you adapt? Can you optimise the orientation and location on the field of play? Check again. That's that. Can you have that one last look? even as the ball is on its way to you, 
Okay, can you have that one last quick look? Check again, confirm that picture and what you're going to do. The decision, can you think quickly and make a decision? Um, and that's all based on the other stuff. Okay, the, the, the bits before it, you, you need to prepare yourself. You need to have information available. You need to get your body right so you can do things. Um, but the decision, I believe, should be evaluated independently from the execution of the game action. Because somebody could make a great decision. You know what? They just didn't execute it quite well. So as coaches, we need to be aware of that. And then execution. So make the play. How effective is the execution of the game action? And again, that should be almost independently evaluated from the decision. Because somebody can make a poor decision, but execute a great pass. You know, and then you get into the terms of, is it a really poor decision or is it, a below average decision, uh, it's you know, so th th there's these things to, to bear in mind, but then follow on next action. How quickly does the player re engage with the game? Because we've all seen it those players that get the ball make a great pass and they stand there and admire it, and you know, it's like they're, they're getting the collar up and they're going. Look at me, look how good that was. And they switch off ever so slightly. Instead, they should be re-engaging in the game straight away. And a lot of the time, that re-engagement should be, I've made the pass. What's the picture now? Because that picture is now going to dictate what can I do to be maximally effective in the next situation. So and that cycle just goes around, back in active scanning. Um, here, Javi, um, one of the best of all time, um, both as a player, but as uh, also with this. And when you see videos of this guy and his his head's like that all the time. But this is what he said: think, think, think quickly. Lift your head up, move, see, think. Look before you get the ball, and it's really crucial. And and too many players don't do that. They'll get the ball, then they look, and and we we need to be help them be better. Right, um, and so to, to understand um, why this is hugely important of scanning off the ball, not just when you're receiving the ball. There was a, an interesting study done in the, the French League, the top league in France, Ligue 1, um, by Chris Callan in 2010. And there's been other studies, and some of the numbers vary a little bit, but, but some, they're largely similar to this. Uh, but time in possession, actual time, in possession, they measured, right? And this was an average. Some players had a bit more, some players a bit less. But time in possession of the ball, physically having the ball in the game, okay, was 53.4 seconds, okay? 53.4 seconds. A game lasts 90 minutes, and players on average were on the ball for 53.4 seconds. So for over 89 minutes, they were off the ball. And again, some numbers will vary, but they won't be far off this. They'll be round about this. There's maybe a bit more time, but this is the kind of time that players have physically on the ball. Okay, the number of times, the average number of times the player actually had the ball, okay, the player physically had the ball was 46.7. So 48 times, 47 times, sorry, they, they had the ball, right? in the game, right, 47 times they got it. And the average time per possession then, when you physically had the ball, when any time you got it, you have it for about a second, 1.1 second is the length of time that you have it. And the average number of touches per possession was two. So again, there, there, there's, there's a few other studies out there that you could look at numbers are slightly different, slightly. But this is kind of what's happening. So... If you are averaging two touches of the ball and you've only ever having it for one second there or thereabouts, you really need to know what's going on around you. And you need to have your decision pretty much in your head before you get the ball so you can be effective with the ball. So there's a lot going on in the game and the vast majority of it is off the ball. Right, so how do we help our players add the skills and abilities that they need to be effective off the ball players? And this is just to highlight. So the 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 blue now is indicating 
you're off the ball. So the little white segment there at the bottom left, that's you on the ball. That's your 53.4 seconds on the ball. The rest of it, you're 89 minutes off the ball. And if you look at the performance cycle then, the execution with the ball, that's the fine little sliver that, that that's made up of actually physically being with the ball. So all these other things you're doing off the ball all the time. You know, you need to be thinking about doing them all the time when you're off the ball. So it, it's hugely important, this scanning element, as an off-the-ball action that players are continually engaging in all the time. Um, a little clip of, of uh, Frank Lampard. and, and uh, just, before, you, uh, before you go on, Kevin, yep. before you go on, I have a question for you. And Certainly. From, 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 um, from George Davis. And it's asking, would it be a good idea for players to have these work cards as reference or homework? The, these what, sorry? Work cards? Work cards, yeah. I guess, I guess with all this information on there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, yeah, and I, th I think if you can help the players understand why this kind of stuff is important, what you do off the ball... Um, you know, and, and we, we can only try so much as coaches to, to help players understand. You know, we know what it's like. When when we were young players, we thought we knew it all and our coach would tell us something and we're like, yeah, yeah, um, I know better. But, yeah, I, th I think the more information that you can provide them in the right in the right ways, you might want to jazz it up, uh, make it look better than that slide and a little bit more player-friendly. But that kind of information, I think, would really hit home to them about how important what they do off the ball is so they could be as effective as possible for those little moments they do get the ball, right? So that's what we're trying to get them to do off the ball. Prepare themselves so they can be as effective as possible when they do get it for that brief moment they do. Um, so, yeah, yeah. If, if you if you help educate your players and, and chat with them and provide them with information like this, it could really could really help them understand why this is important and then under that maybe gives you more of a buy-in from the players of why they need to work on this stuff yeah okay okay um so th this little video clip what um you probably possibly <laughs> i'm sure you have seen this before so uh but if you haven't or even if you have uh, if you haven't count how many times frank lampard looks around here um in this video so Right, so, um, and and if if there's uh, if if anybody's if is anybody putting a guess in, Vin, about how many times he's looked? All right, let me let me. This might be unexpected for them, so let me say to the the, um, the ones online, we're gonna play the clip again. Right. And the question is, how many times did Frank Lampard look around? Right. Oh. I I guess the number already I saw, but so let's look at it again. Put it in the chat, please, so we can be engaging. Go ahead, go ahead. Um. Yep. Okay, guys. Anyone with uh with an idea? I've not seen any, I've not seen any comments as far as that is concerned. Um, I'm assuming that they saw the they're they're seeing the clip quite well. Oh, right, the yeah the so you my my answer is a lot. <laughs> okay, a lot. That's the official right, answer. Is, all right, as Kevin. As one person said seven, which is um, Julie Al Alvaranga. Uh -huh. uh, Wayne Casamir said eighteen. Yeah. Um, Julia Julia said seven. Right. Okay, so and the, George the, David says twenty-two. The, 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 <laughs> the eighteen, the eighteen is the closest. So there's Probably. actually 50, 15 or sixteen little scans in there, yeah. and it's just to show he looks around a lot. He, he makes sure he updates all the information that he needs around him so he could be an effective player. And he was an effective player in the Premier League for a long, long time, scoring 20 goals a season from midfield. Mm -hmm. You know, fantastic player. And this was one 
of the pe the things that helped him. So it's not everything. It's one of the things that helps him be as good as as he was. Um, what I noticed, though, one second before we move on, Kevin. Because what I noticed, he made two initial scans coming mm -hmm. towards first with the ball, and then in quick succession, he just he kept re maybe reassuring himself that they're not closer to him than we we saw them last. Yeah. So he was he, he did all these a lot of scanning uh, scanning right there. Yeah. 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 And and that's it. He's just updating his pictures all the time. Right. So, so he's he's got stuff to work off. So he knows mm -hmm. where people are, knows mm -hmm. teammates mm -hmm. there, opponents there. I've got space here, but mm -hmm. you know. So it, it's really crucial to how people play. And, Can you and do one favor, Kevin? Go back. Uh -huh. We have a little more time, but I don't want to rush it. Can you do me yeah, one yeah. more favor? Can we go yeah. back to the, the, the clip and see if these people can see where they where they where they're counting? Because I have people saying eight, seven. Um, yep. John okay. So, Just one more so, time. So every, every time he moves his head, okay. So, so even when he moves his head there and he moves there, right. So every time he moves his head, there's a scan. So, so have a little look at that. Just trying to play it. We're ready and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and and there's some in there that are almost imperceptible that you can you can only just make the slight head movement. And bear in mind that this is only the head movement. You know, his eyes could be moving around as well, mm -hmm. uh, which means even more. But when you see a picture, you can only judge it on head movements, which mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to talk about in a second. So okay. I'll move on to the next thing. And mm -hmm. um, that this this is the pass completion rates for forward passes in the English Premier League. So there was a study done that I've mentioned his name a couple of times, Gear Jardet, and and he used that video clip um, for for doing some of his studies. And what he did was he so he's he's like the guru on, on the research on this. He's the, he's the guy at the top of the tree in academics and looking at all this scanning stuff. Absolutely fabulous. And I've been lucky to know Gear um, for about 10, 11 years. Um, and I still remember the first time that I, that I met up and we had a coffee and a chat. And it was in London. He was there to do a, a seminar on something else. And uh, we had a coffee and a chat and we were talking about this. And I, I, I was just happy. I was I was chatting with somebody that seemed as passionate and obsessed about this scanning malarkey as, as I was because no many, no many will. But pass completion rates. Uh, so what he did was he measured the midfielders in the English Premier League. OK, midfielders in the English Premier League and he measured how, how often they scanned. And what, what he found was you had those that scanned a lot and those that scanned not a lot. That, that, there was like kind of three groups, but the top scanners, the high frequency scanners, those that looked about a lot versus those that were the low frequency scanners, those that looked about not so much. OK, right. This was the past completion rates of forward <laughs> passes. So those that looked around a lot completed, successfully completed 77% of their forward passes. Are you still there, Vin? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yeah, so, sorry, the uh, sound just went funny in my, my headphone. So mm -hmm. those that looked around a lot successfully completed 77% of their forward passes. But those that looked around the least only completed successfully completed 39% of the forward passes. So those that looked around a lot compete, uh, successfully completed twice as many passes almost as the other group. Right? They are all, and they are all English pre Premier League midfielders. They're all playing at the very top level in England. Right? So they're all good players. Right? It's it's not like we're comparing English Premier League to the local pop team is, you know, it's like for like. So th there was this, there's this one small aspect that's a significant indicator of, of, of quality. So um, it, it, he looked at that, let, let, let us say, so do, do you want the, the, the player that completes passes, retains possession, creates opportunities for his team eight times out of 10? Or would you rather have the player that is giving the ball away over six times out of ten, right? And back to this, they are English Premier. They are good players, 
really good players, top of the game. So what we just want to do as coaches, how can we help them add this to their game, right? How can we help them be better at this that then puts them in a better t- position to make good quality decisions when passing the ball? Mm-hmm. So it's not about saying that they're not good players. It's about they are a good player. How can we help them add something to their game that will help them potentially be even better? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, another quick little clip of Frank Lampard. Yeah. So, and again, all it is about, look how often he looks about. It's 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 a lot. It is a lot. Okay. And and so that's at the top level. And, and yeah, English Premier League. I'm, I'm going to show you a, a clip from the Scottish Premier League, uh, one of the teams that I coached at, uh, Dundee United, um, I mentioned earlier. And we're going to look at a little passage of play here just to show that. You know, it's the Scottish Premier League, and so top level in Scotland, and what do our midfield players do here? So we've got a player in the centre midfield position, but she'll get circled, so I'll just play this. So the midfielder there is the one that we're going to talk about, and you look at him, he's got the ball, he's going to come over and interchange pass. So the ball's on its way, and he's having a look up the field. The ball is coming back to him, he's having a look up the field. Passes the ball again, looks up the field. Right, so he's engaging in active scanning as the ball is going away from him and as the ball is coming towards him. Right, so engaging in active scanning to see what's happening. Is there something up there that I can do? And this is the top level in Scotland. So, and and we assume all, all players at the highest levels do this. Okay, but let's look at the the left back that he interchanges passes with. So we'll look at the same clip again. So here's the centre midfielder. Right. And he, oh, sorry. One clip, I went back there. So here's the centre midfielder, same clip. He's going to interchange, but there's the, the left back, he's circled. Left back, he's just looking at the ball, still looking at the ball. Willow's looking up the field to play. Full back, still looking at the ball. Ball's going there, midfielder's looking up. Full back, still looking at the ball. Full back, still looking at the ball. Midfielder looks up the field of play, fullback still looking at the ball. Now he looks up the field of play. So, again, that's just to show you there's two players playing at the same level, yet two of them have very different behaviours. Mm-hmm. Right? Two, they, they have very different behaviours when interacting with the ball. And we could get into the whole positional stuff and other contributing factors. But the point being that, again, that fullback, is he a bad player? No, he was a good player, right? He was a, a really good player, and, and he's went on to have a, a really good career, right? And th- my point being is, again, not this isn't to say they aren't a good player. It's to say, right, okay, as coaches then, how can we help this player add this to their game? Can we identify that they maybe aren't doing it as often as they could? And can we help them to do it more? So, and again, that's what our job is as coaches. So it just shows you, even at a, a top level, players will have different habits. So how can we get them up there to, to the higher ends? little quote from Thierry Henry. That those that, that, I mean, what a fabulous player this guy was. Um, yeah, one of my favourite players all the time. Another one of my favourite players all the time. But the ball is coming. But while the ball is coming, I'm looking. The ball is coming, right? But I'm looking there. Are they moving? Are they not moving? While the ball is coming, I'm picturing what I'm about to execute, right? And uh, he said that in an interview. Um, and I, I was I was lucky. I've, I've done some stuff through the Welsh FA, and that's where he did his badges. So I've I've been really lucky to be able to sit down and, and have a chat over coffee with him and pick his brains about the, this kind of stuff. Um, and it, it's illuminating the, the way he thinks about the game. It really is. So I get into top players. Some of them really understand that they're doing this others do it on autopilot okay but they, they still do it so key moments for active scanning key moments for this having a look about all right uh, one as the ball is traveling between two players and it could be two teammates it could be two opponents anywhere on the else anywhere else on the field to play 
as the ball moves, have a look. Okay? Because there's nothing else happening. If, when that ball is traveling from player A to player B, nothing else is going to ha happen with that ball. So can the players get used to that? Bump, that's a little trigger for me to check. That's a little trigger for me to have a look. Right? And, and can they get into that idea? So as the ball is traveling between two players, as a teammate or opponent takes a control and touch, so you've got to be able to kind of be good enough to understand are they taking a control and touch or are they going to play it one touch? But as they are taking the control and touch, there's another, they are going to control it and the ball will be paused for a second. So again, it might be a shorter moment that you've got, but again, can you can you have a little quick look? They're controlling mm -hmm. that. Is, is it, they're about to control it. Can I just check that? Because nothing else is going to happen with the ball. But that's very different for a one-touch pass to you. So you've kind of got to be able to gauge that as well. In between touches when a teammate or opponent is running with the ball, and what we're on about particularly is those when they're running space, they're running at speed with the ball. So not necessarily tight control dribbling. We're on about they've, they've got space to cover and they're running at pace with the ball. So the ball is coming at their feet a bigger distance as they're moving with pace. So in between those touches, as they've taken a touch at their feet, there's another moment to have a little look. So bump it at the feet, can I just have a quick check and then look again? Um, because you want to be looking at the player as they're making contact to, to pass to you. And as the ball is travelling when receiving a pass, so as late as possible, but as early as needed. So when you're receiving a, a, a pass, so Vin passes the ball to me, after he's passed it and before my first touch, can I have that little check again, as I call it, that little last look, okay? Right? Now, the important thing is Vin's passing it to me, is I've got to be able to, to observe that ball and see speed in line, and then I can I can do that and I can adjust my feet because to get in line with where I think the ball's going, but I can still have a look and then get my eyes back on the ball. So when the ball is coming to you. And then as the ball is traveling after passing the ball, so we've seen that in the clips there with the behaviors between those two players, but as the ball is traveling after pass, so I get the ball and I'm passing it to Vin now. As that ball is traveling to Vin. Can I look? Can I have a little check? Boom. Can I do that and just see what's there? Because, again, that ball is travelling. So and none of this that I've covered is, is when I am in possession of the ball. You know, that, that's a difference. What we're on about is the off-the-ball scanning moments. Uh, <clears throat> but, but these are five key areas where you can really help players to, to learn to scan and, and get more information in, in those moments because nothing else is going to happen with the ball. The ball is effectively going in a direction until somebody else touches it it's going in that direction so use those moments to scan and as you scan as you get better at and that ball's moving you're scanning and understand i need to move here i need to move there and you're looking and moving so as the ball moves you move have a look very, right very before key. you move on kevin there's a question here pertaining to this um from um kimarthy and kuma mm -hmm. and he wants to know if the player's position influences, you know, um, the scanning problem. I think you, yes. you, you started last over that a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. So, so a, a player's position and, and some great research, again, that Begir and some of his colleagues has shown that there are differences depending on the position that you play. And, for example, you know, um, if I'm a... If I'm a a left back. So here's here's an extreme. My reg, one of my regular scanning patterns will be inside that way and up the field that way. If I'm a left back, okay. So infield, upfield, okay. But if I'm a if I'm a right back, okay. Right. Uh, sorry. If, if I'm a if I'm a right back and I'm I'm here I'm, to do it this way. There is infield and there is upfield. So it's slightly different. OK, and um, what they found is the fantastic research about how often the comparison of what players scan. So, you know, midfielders, central midfielders right up at the top, they need to scan the most. Um, then central defenders, then it was uh, actually strikers were, were, were towards the bottom end of positions. But the way I look at it is we don't know when we're working with young players, we don't know where they're going to end up in the game, what position they're going to play. So we need to help them be as 360 as possible. 
and learn the habit of scanning and looking. And then later on in their career, they're going to be 360 players, but they can then, they're now in a position, because they're 360, they can cope with this if, if, they're, a, if they're a right back, okay? Um, looking inside, looking up the field to play. They can cope with this now. Whereas if we don't help them develop that 360 and we only limit them to a position at a right back as, as, a, as a nine-year-old, well, what if they end up as a centre midfielder later in life? And we haven't helped equip them for that. So it's it's really important, for, I think, that we help players be 360 degree players. And then when they get to the, when they find their position, they can start adopting those habits um, or, or the ones that are more in line with the position norms, let's say. But when I coached at, uh, um, at Partick Thistle from Dundee United, the, the, there was a player there, Paul Payton, a fabulous, fabulous player for us. Um, and it's interesting, I was chatting the guy, the manager, Jackie McNamara, recently about this, and we both think the same, that he was a right back when we were, when when Jackie first got the job at Thistle, and we went, reduced all this awareness stuff, and, you know, he he, he got to grips with, you know, it was, a struggle, it was challenging for all players, but he got there with and he became really good at it, and uh, Jackie moved him from right back into centre midfield. And he, he became the centre midfield for us. And he was he was fantastic at Thistle, getting the ball, switching the ball on oh, no, her because he always had the technical ability. But now this, because he was scanning and seeing more things, more opportunities, more options were now available to him as opposed to maybe they were a bit limited before because he wasn't looking a bit quite as much as he should have. But he had the technical ability to, to switch play. He just didn't know quite the options at that point so it was um yeah players do in different positions will have different uh, scan habits and when they've studied at the top level they've found differences depending on position but if we're working with young kids and trying to get to them at the top level we, we've got to try and give them the maximum benefit we possibly can and then when they get to the top end they can then regress to the norms if 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 that's how, how they end up playing. All right. So is, is that... gonna, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. No, no. That, that, okay. that, that's All right. So I know you're going to answer this question now, but I'm going to give the coach um, you know, credit for asking the question. Uh, not, not, not credit. Um, let me see. Solomon is, uh, say, is saying that he, the, guy, the player you showed was scanning, scan with his eyes alone. I think scanning has quite a bit to do with peripheral vision. And then he goes on to ask a question that I know you're going to be covering now. What activities that can be used during, or what activities can be used during training to develop that vision? So I know you're going to, I know you're going to, um, uh, uh, I know you're going to take them and speak to that now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, we need to understand what we're on about with peripheral vision as well. And then we can get into the whole discussion about, you know, central vision, peripheral vision, and what, what we think. We're on a bit with peripheral vision, or are we on a bit central peripheral awareness? Um, but that that's kind of semantics. Uh, the yeah, the players will use peripheral vision, but it's very hard to if the ball is coming from there behind me, and we're attacking that way. Very hard for me to use my peripheral vision for what's over there. I need to use a head movement to see. So that that's kind of where we're. And again, yeah, Gear, who's the, the top guy. Um, for scanning a scan, um, he defines it as, you know, a movement of the head away from the ball, you know, because that's the clearest indication that players have looked. It's very hard to pick up just eye movements. Um, so uh, he uses that as, as his main tool. Um, and it, he acknowledges certain limitations with that, but a lot of the game, you're needing to move your head. Now, there'll be certain times where you're using peripheral vision, particularly when you're in a 1v1 situation, you'll be using your peripheral vision and the chances are you're focusing on something, using that as a visual pivot and picking up the rest of the information in your periphery uh, and working off that. But a lot of the time, because the area of the field is so large and you're moving in multi-directions, uh, you're needing to move heads to see what's around you here and to see what's around you there. If that makes sense. But but training it, yep, yeah, we'll come on to that. A couple of quick, very quick clips. Um, now, these are some great work by some people out there. And this is a guy called Slavic. Um, 
my apology, I, I wouldn't be able to pronounce his name, Noraski, or I think it is. Uh, uh, he has a mind football in this um, Twitter page uh, that sometimes needs to get changed. But Slavic, uh, I think his name will come up on them. Go on to Twitter. He puts loads of content out there. Absolutely amazing stuff that he does. So this is to show you one of his highlighting, um, scanning, and then please have a, you know, go and follow him on Twitter and, and see the content that he delivers. It's it's great. So we'll have a look at this. Watch, there's De Bruyne that's in the circle and he's he, the, the scanning that he was doing there, he'll rewind it and look, look, De Bruyne, De Bruyne, having a look of it, having a look of it and being able to pick a pass like that. Absolutely superb. Um the, the next clip, so this one's by a company called Be Your Best, which is that Gears Your Debts company, and so they've got a Twitter page. Go and look at their stuff, and they're doing some great work with virtual reality goggles. So these are the two ones that I look at all the time. Great content on Twitter about players scanning, so have a look at that. Uh, so this is Frankie de Jong. Um, and, and again, you can see him looking, so he can make his look, look, he's looking away, looking away. Ball was coming to him there, and he's had his last little look away as the ball is coming to him. Absolutely fabulous. Here again, look at this. You know, the amount of scanning that these top players do. Another quick clip. This is a uh, little G Billy Gilmer at uh, Chelsea. Need to get him in because he's Scottish. So, uh, We'll watch this again. This is be your best. So go and follow them on Twitter and have a look. There he is. He's looking away. He's looking away. Even when the ball was coming to him again, he had a little look away. Look, ball's coming to him. Had a quick little scan just to, to gauge the opposition there. So really important this. And th this is all, all these clips are di almost immediately before players get the ball. And there's that guy's name at the bottom of the screen, Slavik Moravsky. So, that's one of his, that's his own Twitter page, but he's got this mind football in this one as well. Um, so this is Xabi Alonso and scanning. Again, just showing that the top players are looking all the time, looking all the time, looking all the time, then pop. He's He's got somebody away. So again, having a look. What what can he see? What, can, what options can he see? He's always looking, always looking. And now he knows... Because he'd been scanning, he knows what he can and can't do. I'm going to end that there. Um, so to come on to the training part, we've got uh, Arsene Wenger. I love this quote. Yeah, there's a, a clip of him at a, a sports innovation summit, I think it is, or science and sport summit, and he talks a little bit about scanning. But this, this, uh, I've taken this quote at his book, um, his recent autobiography, My, My Life in, in Red, uh, something like that it's called. And this is what he says there. The difference between players is the ability to take in information. In the Premier League, the good players take in around four to six. So they look around four to six times in, in the 10 seconds prior to receiving the ball. The very good players do eight to 10, right, of that in the 10 seconds before they get the ball. It is therefore important to develop exercises that help increase this ability to gather information, this ability to scan. We need exercises that really help this and gear uh, again gear who's did his studies arsene wenger got him in and the the norwegian um uh researchers in to arsenal for a whole season to video all the games to find out all this key information uh for him because he was really interested in this this component of the game so exercises and i'm going to show you Three exercises, uh, four exercises, very quick though. Um, and I'm going to show you drill, uh, what I call a drill, a dynamic exercise, a pose practice. There'll be two opposed practices. Drill, standing in line, A passes to B, B passes to A, or whatever formula. It's a drill, a passing drill. Dynamic exercise is a playing area, no opposition, but players are more free to move around the area. And then opposed practices. You can have different structures, for it, but now there's opposition in there. And I've kept these very simple because they're there just to, to illustrate how we could implement these ideas. The exact dimensions and the exact number of players that you will use will vary depending on what session you're putting on. But here we're going to show a drill straight away, a very basic drill. Now, I don't use drills so much. I prefer dynamic exercises and opposed practices, but some people still use drills. So 
that's okay. Um, how can we add layers into your drills to force players to scan more? So here, I've just got a player hold, holding up cones, and this player's working in the middle, having a look behind him as the ball's on its way. See, hasn't he scanned at the right time there? And this is off my DVDs. I did a couple of DVDs with the Irish FA for resources on their courses, the, the B&A license, and I also sold them as well. But they, the, this is just one of the exercises. So I've got a picture here to highlight this. It's, this is the drill. Um, or that this is a similar passing drill, sorry. Uh, and you've got the player at the end. And what you can see is players holding up a cone. It's a red cone. And you can see this player is now actively scanning even as the ball is coming to him because it's the constraints of the exercise now. I'm giving a, re I'm a reason to look. And it's not just move your head. That's useful. But can you move? Call it the colour. And... So you force yourself to look away and have a scan, then you could look back at the ball. And again, drills are very, very limited because you always know where you're going to look. In the game, you don't always know where you're going to look because everything's moving. But it's to show you that even in a drill, you could add something in that's simple. It just gets them used to this idea of, can I look away while the ball is coming in at me? Um, because it's actually very uncomfortable for players when they're trying it for the first time. The... They don't like it. They don't like it. Next clip then, next little uh, exercise. This is a, a playing area, and it's passed in opposite colours. So inside, the, the blues pass to the greens, the greens pass to the blues. Whenever you're receiving a ball, you've got what I call a flasher on the outside. So there's a green flasher and a blue flasher on the outside holding up cones. Whenever you're receiving a pass, you must spot and call it the colour getting held out up by your teammate on the outside. So if you're in green, you spot the green player. If you're in blue, you spot the blue player. Okay? So, and you see the players on the outside are moving around all the time. And again, this is a... So every time they receive a pass, they've got to have a look. Okay? And that's the basic idea of this exercise. Now, it's a smaller area because that was the confines that we had to film the session, but just to show you the template of the session. Okay. Now, to highlight it here, you can see the yellow flasher is over there. Oh, this is where it's it's um, done up with the yellow ball now. So I've added in a yellow ball instead of it just being a, a, it's a yellow flasher, yellow ball. But you can see the player receiving the yellow ball as the blue player. He's looking at the yellow player to call it the colour as the ball is on its way. And in these sessions, what you find is players very quickly, because it's a coaching point, ask them, when should you know where the player is on the outside? And they'll go, when I'm receiving the pass. Okay, what, when the ball's on its way to you. But that's the first time you look. That's too late. We very quickly get the understanding. Can you know where they are all the time? So where's the football? Where's the player on the outside? I move around. Where's the football? Where's the player on the outside? And start engaging in active scanning and building a scanning pattern. Here's a, one of post practice. And what you'll see is the you, you've got... It's the blue players, the players in blue against the players in green. So there's four blues against two greens. You've also got one yellow player on the inside and one red player on the inside. And they cooperate with the blue team. Okay. And the way the blue team score is by passing it to one of the either the red or yellow and then getting it back again. But to score, the player receiving it back from the red or yellow must spot and call it the colour getting held up by the correct player on the outside. You see the flashers on the outside, the red and yellow. So if I'm receiving the ball back from the yellow, I need to spot and call it the colour getting held up by the yellow player on the outside. If I'm receiving the ball back from the red, I spot and call it from the red player on the outside. So again, when I'm in here, I'm thinking, where's the footballs? Where's these players? Where are the two players on the outside? Because that's what happens in the game. We play here, but we also want to go there. So I... So there you go. So blue passes it into yellow, and you've seen the yellow, the the blue player looking. So what what I would what what I'll do here is actually I'll I'll bring this back and I'm going to pause it here. Now, when that ball is going into this yellow player, have a look at the player that the blue player that's over to the left of him. He's he's starting to understand. Oops, he's starting to understand that he has to have a look. 
He has to have a look. So when it goes into the yellow, watch this player here. Watch. Look. He has a look. He's having a look. He, he was having a look. Now, he didn't get the ball, but he prepared himself just in case he did get the ball. Okay? So, again, just to show you a picture here and talk through this, there's the yellow flasher on the outside. He's holding up a cone because the yellow player on the inside has the ball. Whoever is going to receive the ball off the yellow player must spot and call out the colour getting held up by the player on the outside before his first touch. So you can see here, this blue player is going to receive the ball off the yellow. And he's already looking over before that the ball is still at the yellow player's feet. He's already checked to see where the yellow player is on the outside. So he'd be able to have that last scan and call out the colour as the ball is on the way. So they can't just focus on the ball now. And they can't just focus on what's immediately around the ball. They need to learn to shift their attention from the ball to other areas. And the important thing is people go, ah, but it's red and yellow cones. What's that got to do with the game? It's not about the red and yellow cones. It's about he's lifted his eyes to locate a key player on the outside. Now, that key player is holding up a cone. But he has to locate that key player. And calling out the colour is just confirmation that he's seen him and he knows where this player is really, right? So as a coach, it's great feedback. We're standing there and we're watching. Did he spot him? Did he call it the correct colour? Because if he doesn't look and he doesn't call it the colour, we know that he hasn't looked, he hasn't scanned. So it's great feedback for us. And last little session, here's a, a we've got a, a 2v1 in the middle, two players in green in the middle against a red. And we've got four players on the outside, two yellows, two blues. And again, when it goes out to the outside player, the way he scores, the greens need to get one pass in the middle, then they can pass it to an outside player. Whichever way it goes out, the opposite player holds up a, a cone. Whoever receives the ball back into the middle has to call it that colour. So I'll run it, and then we've got a picture to, to illustrate it again. So you can see them. But you see them. They start to scan. They're having a little look, called it the colour. Little pass between them. There we go. It goes out. Their body shape, having a look up the field of play. The thing is, when you if you don't put in this constraint, they don't look, okay? They don't. They tend to get lazy. They don't get their body shape right. They don't have a look up the field of play. It's just a simple constraint to add in to force them to scan. And then in this, you know, again, you would have different numbers in here, etc. So, again, just a picture to show. He, this player here is holding up the cone, right? And um, Because the ball is at the opposite yellow player at the far end of the grid. And already you could see the green player is scanning to have a look where that player is and what he's holding up. And I often, you see, again, the numbers may change in this exercise, and I see this kind of exercise getting done everywhere, but the players, when they're receiving the ball back off the player on the side, terrible body position. Don't look anywhere else apart from the ball. Why? Because you've not given them a reason to. So they might get the ball, and what they'll do is they'll generally play within the constraints of that peripheral vision. And you can't rely on just that peripheral vision because you end up firefighting for the ball. What you've got to be able to do is kind of get myself in a position and realise if there's an opportunity there. Can I play the out ball? Can I switch the play? Can I play it someday in space? So you need that, but you also need that. So this is these exercises bring this up. Um, and just wrap up there, another couple of pictures of me just to show you with the players with the gloves on there on the right. Um, first team training at Dundee United. Or in fact, on the right and the bottom left, that's Dundee United. There's the same player, 90 Ryan Gold, great wee player, young player um, there. But to show you implemented it, the bottom in the middle, uh, that's Partick Thistle. Uh, got the gloves on. Uh, top left there, that was a session, uh, one of the sessions I was doing uh, at um, Dinamo Zagreb in Croatia. I've got red and blue gloves there. I colour-coded it to their team colours. <laughs> so um, so I just varied it up. Uh, but it's effective and it works. So that's that, Vin. That's it, really. Uh, Kevin, uh, brilliant, brilliant presentation. I couldn't, couldn't ask for anything better. You know, um uh, the coaches, I know one coach has said this is, this is this is excellent, you know, uh, it is. But before you do, I 
you know, there's there's one area that you mentioned. You started mentioning, mention, but we wanted wanted to talk to the soccer IQ. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Okay. Um. Yeah. So tell tell us all about soccer IQ. Um. So soccer IQ. Now that's basic my, my independent, you know, training um, mm -hmm. business where you know I, I do coach education. You know, if, so. I'll, I can work with, I can coach teams, I can coach small groups, I can coach individual players. I do that, um, but also do coach education. So when I went out and presented on the coaching courses or clubs or organisations have asked me to, to to come and just work with their coaching staff or, or people have asked me, oh, can you come down for a week and do a week's training with our, our team? Yep, I've managed to do that. So, um, or go and do camps, that kind of thing. So, that, that, that was what I set up um, for myself to, to be able to do it independently and go out and, and help people, you know, help coaches understand or get into the discussion with coaches of what the things that they might be able to try to help bring this out in their players. And what I'd like to say, Vin, is I'm, I'm very keen to emphasise that I'm not saying this is the way. It's not the only way to train this. It's mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. way and it's proven to be effective. It's then it's the way I use Um I'm sure there are many creative coaches out there that are trying different things that, that help the, the players scan more. But mm -hmm. the, I've done this and and I, I go out and try and help people. And let's like say I, I use the different colours and in sessions as well. I'll have tennis balls going about as well. So now you're receiving the pass, you're needing a call a colour getting held up there, but you're needing to pass a tennis ball to a player over there all before your first touch and you've got opposition so you cannot lose the football. So there's a lot going on and people go, but colours and tennis balls, what's that got to do with it? Well, it's the con it's what the constraint is helping the player try and do. Because mm. I know I need to I need to scan and know where that player is so I can call it that colour. To pass this tennis ball to the right player, I need to scan and know where the player is that I can pass the tennis ball to. Mm -hmm. And now also because there's opposition, I need to scan and know where the opposition is. So now I'm, it's like an awareness gym. It's a scanning gym for players to. It's still football, but it has this strong element of emphasising the increased scanning to help them develop that as a behaviour that they then take into games. You know, and so so we did that. Uh, you know, I've done that in places, and I've been working with a publisher to to put a book together, so I can try and share these ideas and knowledge on a on a wider basis for people. So hopefully that will be it as well. And you know, and I'm always willing to engage with people and chat with them and and, and talk about this because it's a passion of mine. And I'm also willing for people to fly me over to beautiful places in the world to put on sessions and clinics and work with the players. I definitely, 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 definitely. I look forward to that too. But what, what, what? Uh, no, I said, I mean, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You know, today was a good day for some coaches listening to that. You know, I think scanning definitely is something that is not focused on at a young age, and you can see it. It, it um, you can see it, it manifests itself. At the older, when they get to the older level, they, they, they're not used to that. Mm. So, yeah. I really want to thank you um, for a, a brilliant presentation, Kevin. want to thank all uh, the, the, the coaches that joined and others who are not actively coaching. Uh, looking forward to another session with you at some point. But, um, you know, once again, I, I, I really, really appreciate you coming on. No problem at all, Vin. I really enjoyed it, and I could have went on for hours and hours. I love this stuff. I know, I, I know. We all can. <laughs> all right, Kevin, thanks much again. Right. Thanks very much, Finn. Thanks, everyone. All right, take care.